time of day is it? It's morning. Okay, I was about to say good morning because it still felt like morning, but this is only my second day in Europe, so the time of day that it feels like to me is a moving target. You don't want to trust me on that question. But it is, in fact, morning, so good morning and thank you for being here. Uh, on the schedule, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's been updated, but it may say that this talk is being delivered by a guy named Ben Stopford. And let me tell you a story about Ben Stopford. Uh, ben Stopford is about to be the proud father of twins and uh, a uh, travel date schedule that he thought was prudent uh, some months ago turned out not to be prudent. So uh, late in the game, he kind of put a, a ban on travel. And uh, so today, the part of Ben Stopford will be played by Tim Berglund. If, if you saw that in the schedule, I wanted to make sure that was clear because that would have been weird and surprising. Also, this is important, I've got another talk later in the day with a similar title and fairly similar content. Now, the Ben version of this and the Tim version of this are, are different, but you're going to get a very Tim flavor of this that will feel a lot like the talk later, so I want your expectations to be set there. If you're planning on being in the Tim track, um, that's great. I love you, but uh, those second two talks will be not, uh, not identical, but similar, and you should, uh, you should be forewarned. So anyway, hi. Um, this talk is uh, material that's really exciting to me. Who, who was in the K-SQL talk downstairs just now? Um, oh, I love it. Okay, yeah. I, I love that talk because there's live coding and because K-SQL is just so easy to get, right? Like you do it and everybody gets it right away and it's immediately obvious that this is powerful and you want it to be a part of your life. What's not immediately obvious, and I hinted at this in that talk, is that Kafka has this agenda for you. It like wants you to build things in a certain way. Like you think it's, it's like ActiveMQ, but bigger. You know, but like I can scale out. And everybody wants to scale out, right? If you can do it on 20 servers, that's cooler than one. Um, so that's fine. But uh, Kafka has an architectural agenda for you. It has designs on you and, and wants you to build systems in a different way. It's, it's not just a big pipe. And this talk and the talk this afternoon are really getting at that. How is it that I'm supposed to build systems and, and what, does, what does Kafka want out of me? Now, there is a book that covers this. It's called Designing Event-Driven Systems. And um, just you can probably just Google that. Uh, it's by Ben. And it is dense. Let me tell you what. Like, it's, it's not long, but you may want to read it twice. And it's not because it's difficult or poorly written or anything. I, I have read it. Uh, it's very well written. But the ideas in it are fairly meaty and... I just want to say, important. I think this stuff matters a lot. So I recommend the book as a, as a follow-up. Now, what have we got to say here? There are these kind of two things that come together. One is uh, what we might call event-driven architectures, uh, sometimes uh, event sourcing. And this is all thinking that happens in the domain-driven design community. All right, I am somewhat, somewhat something of an outsider to that community. I'm like not a DDD guy. Um, it's Actually, literally the truth is that some of my best friends are domain-driven design people, um, but I'm really not one of them, but certainly we're aware that, that uh, event sourcing is a thing that comes from the domain-driven design world. On the other side of that, there is this notion of stream processing. Now, these two things are closely linked, but they are optimizing for different goals, right? Uh, event-driven architectures are thinking about how can I deal with complex domain logic Stream processing is how can I deal with event streams at internet scale with lots of servers because that's better than few and we just like big systems, you know. So those are different things, but uh, we're going to talk about how they come together. That's what this talk is about. And there are things that get big. There are things with complex domains uh, that get pretty big. We have Netflix, and um, this, the trouble with this slide is you have to update it all the time because it, the, the numbers just keep getting bigger. It's crazy. But as of fairly recently, 2.2 trillion messages per day. 400 microservices per cluster, and large clusters. 200 is a big Kafka cluster. You don't see many clusters that big. 20 is, is more typical. 200 is huge. Um, ING, uh, the, the, the Dutch bank, you can tell because it's orange, 
um, a billion messages a day, 20,000 messages per second, you know, really, really uh, big, big numbers. So these things come together in events. And that's really, this, this talk is about events, what they are, and once you get that idea into your, into your mind, uh, how do you now build systems based on events? So there are two, uh, two roles that events play. There are two things that they do. One is notifications. When you saw that, you heard the sound, didn't you? You heard a little sound, right? Like, uh, I have to go look right now. Somebody wants me. Um, the slide is triggering to me. Um, anyway, events serve as notification, and that is um, a, a temporally distinct indication that a thing has happened. But they also can carry state with them. So they are notification and they are data. It's, it's temporally distinct and information rich. <laughs> events have those two roles, and I'll come back to this topic a few times. <clears throat> Now, uh, there's some processing that happens in there to come up with the notification and to come up with uh, the data. And the question is kind of what, what sort of system do you build to, to deal with these two things, to deal with uh, notification and data replication, to deal with events? And here's kind of the canonical streaming platform architecture diagram right here. There's a lot to unpack in here. Uh, there is the, the suggestion that there's some large community of mobile devices and it, it is creating events that are being ingested into Kafka. And if that's, if that's all you knew about Kafka, that would kind of be the old school of, of big giant pipe, you know, that I can ingest all these events and, and put them somewhere. And that was, that was Kafka of five years ago, was, oh, there's all these events, let me put them somewhere, and what is that somewhere? Well, that's an HDFS cluster, right? Like, quick, write them into HDFS so we can do something with them. Um, that's not... That's not modern Kafka. Uh, these other components here we'll talk about a little bit. So, and I'll, I'll, I'll dig into the parts of this diagram. But this is sort of the canonical streaming platform system that we're, that we're going to work with. Let me give you an idea of what I mean by a streaming pipeline. Uh, and that's with a, with a fairly simple example here. So those mobile apps, maybe there's a couple kind of events that we're capturing. A couple kind of things that we want to think about. One is apps being opened. I open the app, and it posts to some endpoint a little blob of JSON saying, this person opened the app at this time, right? Uh, also, when the app crashes, uh, usually we can get some kind of help in posting a notification, or when the app restarts after it crashes, it can know that it crashed and say, hey, here's a crash report, and it'll post that data to some other endpoint. So it produces those two kinds of events, right? Apps opened and apps crashed. Now, we can... Um, we can group those and window them and come up with crashes per day and app opens per day. And if I have uh, which apps get opened and how much per day and which apps crash and how often per day or how many times per day, I can join those two things and come up with a collection of applications that I will label unstable. And this is a streaming pipeline because the inputs are events. They're not database tables. I don't have to take events and write them into a table. We want these to be events stored in Kafka um, and, and processed as uh, streaming data. Now, if you were in the KSQL talk, you're already ahead of the game. You could probably kind of imagine what that KSQL would look like. There are other ways to skin that cat that we'll talk about. But that's, that's the basics of what I mean by streaming pipeline. All right, let's keep... Uh, looking at this, and let's dig into this piece right here. In the event that uh, you're not super up on Kafka and uh, you weren't in the last talk, let me give you a little bit of an idea of what I mean, what, what, what's going on inside Kafka. The fundamental abstraction inside Kafka is a log, all right? And when messages are produced, they're written to the end of the log, and they're always written to the end of the log, and they're immutable. It's just like an application log, right? Uh, with an application log, you have some API that says, hey, let me, let me produce this message. And there's no notion in that API of where it goes because it always goes to the end of the file, right? You don't have to think about where it gets written. It gets appended to the end. And there's also no support in any of the dozens of, say, Java logging APIs. I think we're up to dozens now. Um, there's no support for editing a log, right? Because what are you if you're editing a log, 
you are a criminal, uh, probably, or at least a conspirator. You're, you're probably trying to cover something up. You don't edit logs. So yeah, these messages are also immutable. Once they're written, uh, they stay there, and that enables all kinds of amazing functionality that we'll get to uh, by the end. There can be multiple readers of a log, or in Kafka, what we call multiple consumers, and each consumer has its own offset. Are we back? Yes, we're back. Good, okay. Um, yeah, multiple consumers. Each consumer can have its own offset, and those are all tracked independently. So Fred and Sally and George, those are going to be independent applications that are doing different kinds of computations over the, the events in the log. And you can rewind, that is, you can seek to a particular offset. The API allows you to say, hey, let's go back to this numerical offset or this timestamp and begin consuming messages from there. Otherwise, by default, when you start up as a brand new consumer, you're going to be getting the latest message. Or you can say, I'd like to start at the earliest message and reprocess all of history. Those are your options. But you don't really query a log. You just consume it uh, one message at a time. That, of course, would be a terrible way to live, right? If that were the only abstraction you had, ugh, um, all you have is just reading messages one after another. So we're going to have to do better than that, but this is a great building block. And turning that building block into a useful system is, is really what the rest of the talk is all about. But let me, let me give you just a little bit more Kafka smarts here. Um, that gray box is really a collection of machines called brokers, uh, and those brokers work together to be a Kafka cluster, and the, the, uh, they maintain a collection of what are called topics, and pretty much every other messaging system in the world calls them topics too, so you probably know what topics are. Those are just named queues of messages. Uh, but importantly, in Kafka, they can be partitioned. I can take a single topic and split it up into pieces and distribute those pieces over multiple brokers. So I'm able to scale out my, my topic management. And internally, uh, topic handles, or pardon me, Kafka handles replication of those things and you know, consistency between replicas and all the stuff that comes up in being a distributed system that's all terrible and you're glad you don't have to write it. It's all, it's all there. And uh, we're content for purposes of this to literally wave hands and say that stuff works and let's not worry about it. Um, and, of course, things like fault tolerance. Because there's replication, I can lose a broker, and I've still got the data elsewhere. Uh, my consuming services on the right there, uh, if one of those goes down, Kafka gives me the ability to have those be fault tolerant also. So, you know, one of my consumer instances dies. I can take the work that it was doing, the partitions it was processing, and fail them over to one of the other consumers. So all those basic building blocks are kind of there and... That's nice because, you know, we, we do, this sort of snuck up on us in the last, like, five or six years. Everybody's all of a sudden a distributed systems developer. Like, we're all supposed to be building these elastically scalable fault-tolerant systems, and that's super hard. Uh, but Kafka makes a lot of that easy through mechanisms that will just kind of... Uh, I'll ask you to take on faith, and we can talk about this afternoon if you want to talk about more. Now, uh, those... Uh, what did we zoom in on here? Uh, basically, we're zooming in on the consuming services here. The brokers are just doing messaging. That Kafka cluster component is just doing pub sub and storage. And I was talking to somebody on the way up. They said, hey, we want to build something where we don't ever want to get rid of data. We want storage to be infinite. I said, that's fine. Just partition and plan and buy disks and scale out and Kafka will keep it forever does not have to delete data. By default, Kafka retains data for seven days, but you're able to configure that, and you can make it infinity days if you want. Uh, so that's totally cool. Kafka's doing storage. It's doing pub sub. Those brokers don't ever do any computation on data, though. That is the province of things like KSQL and things like Kafka Streams. Now, Kafka Streams is a Java API that is just a library that you code against as long as you're writing in Java. If you're not writing in Java, it's not super exciting. But if you are, it's actually very exciting. It's a really cool API that makes your application, whatever your application is, it's a Spring Boot thing, it's a, it's a whatever uh, framework you want to use, uh, you can now also uh, declare this Kafka Streams API as a dependency. It's a part of Apache Kafka, so it's completely open source. 
and you can build these sophisticated stream processing topologies that you deploy with your app. That code stays with your app. It's not in this other processing cluster somewhere else. It's a part of your application. So mentally, the stream processing and whatever your app does, those are one thing, right? That's one program you're thinking about. And then in terms of deployment, that's also one program that you deploy. And the clustering of that program kind of gets done for you, again, by the, the consumer group stuff. Um, but because, uh, so Kafka Streams is a Java API, and um, how many Java people here? Can I see hands? Yeah, hi, you're my people. Um, <laughs> this is DevOps, I suppose. Uh, how many, like, definitely, for sure, not Java people? All right, I salute your bravery, putting your hand up at DevOps. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be showing you examples in KSQL, but I encourage you, fellow Java developers, look at Kafka streams. Um, KSQL is much easier, much easier to get, uh, but for the microservices case, there, and if, you, if you're a, a Java developer or Java shop already, lots of reasons to go the KSQL route. So I encourage you to check that out. There's some resources online on the Apache Kafka website for some Nice tutorial videos of this guy I know uh, that can tell you a little bit, about, a little bit more about that. So anyway, if you wanted to do this, remember I, I said we have apps opened. Those are just raw application opening events, and we want to turn that into apps opened per day. We would do something like this, this KSQL query right here. We're going to create a table called opened per day from this select statement. Let me just walk through this a line at a time. All right, select application ID and count. That makes sense. From apps opened. And apparently, the schema of that apps opened stream has an application ID, at least, and, and maybe a time, I don't know. Uh, but it's at least an application ID. So we're, we're selecting the application ID and the count from that, grouping by application ID, and then within uh, one day windows. So we're going to basically reset the count every day is what that means. Uh, and we're making this a persistent query. So this is running in the background in the KSQL engine, producing the opens per day into a topic called opened per day. So the results of this query are going to get spit out into that topic. All right, now KSQL will just go run in the, the KSQL engine, uh, doing its little thing at scale, taking these events in, processing them, managing state, handling failover, doing all the stuff that KSQL does for you, and producing the results into the output topic, which was called opened per day. Now, that's, that's roughly stream processing. Let's look a little bit at event-driven architectures. <clears throat> uh, this is a subtle point, and this, this is, I think, a thing that event-driven architectures are trying to get you to. Uh, this also comes up if, if you get people talking about microservices, and you get them talking not um, merely in terms of the buzzword, but in terms of the, the I mean, what I, I, I see like a, a human and organizational angle here, if you get microservices into your blood. <clears throat> when I say we build ecosystems, um, what I mean is in a, like in a real life ecosystem of living things, uh, there are a bunch of competitors for resources, and they more or less sort of balance each other out. And sometimes new things can enter an ecosystem, and sometimes that's very bad, right? Like, like you know, rabbits that don't have enough predators and they take over Australia, or um, I just read about some really terrible kind of weed that's growing in the southern United States that has these like, spines on it, and it'll give you third-degree burns on your skin, and like, well, that's great. What's that? It's a what? Yep, yeah, it's not poison ivy. It's much worse than poison ivy. Uh, poison ivy would be like hand lotion compared to this thing. So, um, yeah, so sometimes bad things happen. And maybe, like, we've all written that code, right? Um, certainly I have. But, you know, sometimes bad things come into ecosystems. But also, it's not like one, el like the, the rabbit that lives in my yard is aware of what kind of weeds are growing in the field next to my yard. It doesn't think about that right? The rabbit just does its thing. And if something changes over here, maybe the rabbit's behavior will change, fine, but the rabbit doesn't coordinate with the weeds. As an ecosystem, 
uh, things happen and they can balance out, but you don't have to worry about centralized management of the thing. It just kind of works. You screw it up. It's not like you can't break ecosystems. We do that all the time. Um, but there is not top-down control over that. And if you've got, if you're building microservices, you're building ideally an ecosystem where you don't have top-down control over everything, but people are able to stand up new services maybe without everybody knowing. Like maybe there's somebody who knows, but maybe you're a developer of, of one set of services and somebody else stands up another set of them uh, that's interoperating with your data and maybe you don't even know it. Like you're the rabbit that doesn't know that that weed is growing over there yet. Now maybe that weed tastes good and you'll figure it out later and there's something you can do, but you, nobody asks you. That's kind of what I mean by ecosystem. So uh, here's a diagram of um, some services and the font is a little small. I doubt you can see that in the back. But there's a, there's a, I'll just kind of point things out here. Um, there's a UI and there's a, a web server that that web front end is talking to and that web server is issuing requests to a payment service, an order service, shipping service, stock service, and customer service. Now, this, uh, this diagram right here, oops, uh, this diagram right here, I could have put this on a slide 15 years ago on a SOA presentation uh, this could be an event-driven architecture presentation. It could be a microservices presentation, right? Very, very generic kind of thing. Um, and it has actually, for that whole time period, it's been somewhat difficult to build this. It's, it's easy to talk about. You say, hey, let's break things into services. But it's hard to do because of data. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If you look at um, the, the things that I'm dealing with here, customers, orders, and stock or, or catalog, right? Most services are not interested in just one part of that. Like, you know, say the order processing service. Well, it just cares about orders, right? No, it cares about catalog and it cares about customers and uh, everybody kind, kind of needs a little bit of everything. And that was easy back when we could have one database. When we built a monolith, we had one database and all of the modules in our monolith could just do whatever they needed to with the data. Uh, most of us have reached the understanding that that's probably a bad way to build large systems and we're, we're trying to stop. Um, and so when we break things into services, we hit this unfortunate realization that most of them share what the slide says is the same set of core facts. They, they want to share data. And we have to come up with a way of dealing with that. Now, recall what I said before, which is that events wear these two hats. Events are notifications and events are state. They are replication of data. So let's consider this subset simplified version of our thing. We're going to buy an iPad. So we have the order service, the shipping service, and the customer service. So we've, we've broken our monolith down into microservices because we went to a talk that said that was a good idea. And we're doing it with, um, and it, the talk wasn't wrong. I think it is a good idea. Um, we're doing it with uh, integrating the services through RPC calls. All right. So the web server tells the order service, hey, somebody placed an order. Uh, here's the form submission. Blah, here you go. So go deal with that. The order service says, all right, let me validate that. Looks good. Now I need to tell the shipping service to ship it. And so it makes a synchronous RPC call to the shipping service. Shipping service says, well, I need to make sure we have the things and I know where to send them. So I'll go ask the customer service for the current address, and that'll bring the address back from the customer service. Those are all synchronous calls. And that works, right? I don't mean to set that up as too much of a straw man because there are people who, who build microservices estates this way. Uh, it is a little bit finicky in that they can be brittle. Right? You can get failure cascades. If you have one service that goes down, then you have to have you know, circuit breakers and things to make sure... Uh, your world doesn't explode. So it's, and obviously a guy who's here to talk about Kafka is going to say something negative about this, but I don't, my point is I don't want to be sloppy in that negativity. There are people who do this and do it successfully, uh, but I'd just like to show you a more excellent way. Uh, and that's this. So let's convert this a piece at a time. The order now comes into the order service, and that order service has local state in it, all right? It's got a local representation of orders, that it can look up quickly if it needs to. But when it creates a new order, validates that order and creates it, it's going to publish a message now to a Kafka topic and say, here's a new order. Here's a new valid order. The shipping service is just sitting around waiting for new valid orders to come in on that topic. And when it sees one, it consumes it. And it's unfortunately still synchronously talking to the customer service, but it'll go talk to that customer service. 
and get the customer data. But now the, the orders and shipping services are decoupled. They're, they're no longer synchronously coupled. They're asynchronous uh, through the Kafka queue, the Kafka uh, topic. Nice thing here about the, the multiple consumers thing, like clearly shipping service is an interested consumer of validated orders. Who else might be an interested consumer of validated orders? I don't know, maybe you're writing a new spam campaign and you wanna send email to people based on some sort of analytics you run over orders. Well, now you're a new consumer. You can stand up a new service. This is what I mean by ecosystem. Orders, the order service doesn't know who's gonna read those orders and doesn't need to care. You just get to innovate. Things get to grow in your garden here, uh, new, new services. And, um, well, you know, for example, uh, we might have a, a new repricing service that stands up that says, well, you know, let me uh, take a look at, at validated orders. Oh, hey, this is a special order. Uh, I need to tweak the pricing of it because there's such and such a volume discount or something about the, the customer. Uh, we get this ability to, to, as I said, for new services to grow in the ecosystem. Now, um, Let's talk about state a little more. Uh, as we do this, we encounter that difficult reality that many of our services are, as I said before, dealing with the same set of core facts. Or to put that less abstractly, uh, shipping service needs customers. So let's rewrite customers to every time there's a change to customer data and it, assume it has some REST interface on its outer uh, surface that allows people to change, you know, allows from the web interface uh, to, to change customers, customers to edit their address or their name or whatever. Um, and every time a cus the customer service is aware that a customer has changed, it publishes that changed record to a Kafka topic. Now the shipping service, in addition to uh, subscribing to uh, validated orders, is going to subscribe to updated customers and it's gonna keep its own local materialized view of that customer data. So the canonical location, or the, 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 the place that has primary responsibility for customer data is the customer service, but I'm saying, no, it's okay, make a copy of that data and keep it inside the shipping service. Which, at first blush, sounds awful because I have this mutable data and I have two copies of it, right? We don't want that at all. Um, but the fact is, it's yes, customers are mutable, but the system of record is this topic in Kafka. It's the customer's topic in Kafka, and all of the events in that topic are immutable. So I am perfectly safe consuming that topic in whatever services I want, like, say, shipping service, and making a new, basically, you know, what looks like a mutable database of customers because that mutable database is just a materialized view over the same log of immutable events. So it's okay, you can make as many local copies of that as you want because the system of record is an immutable event stream. And that's, that's basically what we do here. Uh, notification and data replication. We've seen both of those things happen now. All right, let's talk about uh, state a little bit here. Inside, that, that uh, shipping service is probably implemented, I'm guessing if it's written in Java, it's probably a Kafka Streams application. We might have a little KSQL running somewhere that, that helps us do that. And uh, uh, specifically, what that lets us do is, is this on the next slide? Yes, it is. It lets us create a thing called a K table. Now, in the Kafka Streams API, a K table is an in-memory representation of data in a Kafka topic. So the, uh, what otherwise would be you know, a, a difficult process of us consuming a bunch of messages and coming up with some in-memory way of storing them, you know, some hash table that scales to large sizes or something, I just say, hey, Kafka Streams, I'd like to create a K table out of this thing. And now that K table object gives me an API for querying things by key. And I've got the sufficient mechanism for looking it up. The partitioning of the Kafka topic holding customer data, 
yeah, we're still talking about customers here. Uh, let's say that's a five partition topic. Customers isn't going to get too huge, probably. I mean, unless you're Amazon, it's probably not going to be that big. Um, but you want the ability for it to grow a little bit. Let's say it has five partitions. Uh, well, I can potentially now deploy five instances of my shipping service, and automatically the Kafka cluster will, will assign the, each of the five customer partitions to each of the nodes in the cluster. So just by writing this Kafka Streams application, I've gotten a little scalable thing for free. And building up that local materialized view, that database, uh, I'm not implying that I had to deploy a little Postgres alongside my, my server to get that database. It, I can have that for free from the Kafka, the Kafka Streams API. Now, a note on that. If I don't want to use Kafka Streams for that, and there's actually a reason for you to have, like you have sophisticated querying needs and you need all kinds of secondary indexes on things and basically you do need a database, that's totally okay. You can create from the messages in the topic, uh, you can materialize an actual relational database with tables in it and have that be a part of your service. There's nothing in the world wrong with that. Um, now, I'll show you a little bit of Kafka Streams code. Uh, we saw some KSQL before. I'll show you a little bit of Kafka Streams code, and uh, we will apply these things. So imagine orders and customers being these two topics that we are consuming. Now, customers, we're going to create a table out of that. We're going we're gonna, to uh, create a K table out of customers because fundamentally, uh, customers are a table. I can represent them in a topic. I can have a change log topic with all my, my updated customers in it. But the basic structure there is that that's a, that's a table. And orders uh, may be a table. I may, I may represent orders as events. Um, that Kafka Streams code is, is just this Java API. I can do this thing. I can say, well, look, I've got a, a topic called orders out there. Let me make a stream out of that. Let me join it to the customer's topic and basically join these, these two topics together and then I can transform the resulting key value pairs in any way I want. Now, um, and then persist that to a new stream called shipments. This is clearly very pseudocody because the details of Kafka streams are a whole talk on their own, but I wanted you to at least see that code so you can know it's just Java. And it is, I'll just digress for a moment. Um, it, it, there's a bit of a learning curve to it, right? Like when I talk to teams that have gotten really good at, at streams, there's always this sense of, hey, we got over the hump and like not many people have and we're not going to stop now. You know, it's, they, they feel as if they have achieved a thing. It's not that hard, um, but there is a, a, certainly a curve to this because it's a new kind of programming. Most of us, if you have a computer science degree or, or you know, formal training, you probably took a class in how to do relational database design. Um, like you have to, or if you didn't take a class in that, you have done it. And, you know, you've been educated in the school of life of how to do this. But uh, we have not done this with streaming yet. So the first streams app you write, not only do you have to learn the API and the particulars of it and wrestle with the typing and all that kind of stuff, uh, but the, the concept of stream processing is kind of new for us. Question? Yes. So the question is, uh, how is it that we have customers in the stream? How do those come to be? Uh, so there's a, a topic called customers, and the customer service is producing updates into that topic. When, it, when people edit their profiles or create new profiles, it'll produce a message into that topic. Yeah, that, that join would not work then. You'd need... You need to make sure that to, to create an order, you've already created an account, and so the customer exists before the order exists. Sure, that's fine. If it's an old account. Yeah. Oh, 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 if it's an old... Yeah, so customers, you'd want a long retention period on that, or better yet, you'd want to make it a compacted topic, which is somewhat beyond scope, but the, the, the short story is... You don't have to, it, it doesn't have to be that those messages get deleted. 
like I said, we can make Kafka store, store data indefinitely, and that's what you'd do. Yes. You said the, what he said, I've got my entire database in Kafka. He's got it. You do, and that's a good thing. So uh, more on that. Now, let's continue. Um, What we've talked about here is uh, we've, we've just gone through the log and the streaming engine, and we've talked briefly about the producer and the consumer. Um, also, there will be databases in your system that are, are still relational databases, and all that data is not in Kafka yet. And that's where the connectors come in. Kafka Connect is a system for getting legacy data into topics. And you find once you start going down this path, of trying to build an event-driven system, uh, you've got, uh, you, you want more data to be in topics. You have a legacy database, and that's kind of a pain now and hard to work with, and you would rather get that into topics, and that's, that's what those connectors are for. That's a standard way to get uh, legacy data from outside the system and inside. All right, let's work through an example. So we've got um, here a somewhat simplified thing. Uh, similar to what we were looking at before, there's an order service, and we have uh, received orders, validated orders, and completed orders in Kafka. Now, let's do a few things to this. So, converting legacy databases to events using Kafka Connect. We might have out here uh, this legacy stock database, and we'll use Kafka Connect to capture changes to that database and produce them into a topic called products. All right, so now, that, now we've got data from that, that database we can't touch into topics. And this is Kafka Connect. And Connect is a framework that's one of those things that you'd write if somebody didn't write it for you. Like you'd come up with this, this need to capture stuff from text files or capture stuff from relational databases, and you'd write that as a little framework. Connect is already there being that framework for you. Uh, there are a number of ways to do change data capture with Kafka Connect from relational databases. So you get that legacy data into events. So uh, that's, that's an important step. Now that you've got those events in Kafka and all of my order events are in Kafka, um, I can say, well, it's okay for me to make this my, my uh, source of truth, my single source of truth. All my orders are there. All my products are there now. Sure, there's this legacy product database, but I'm going to consider the version in Kafka to be the truth. And so now I can write reporting services, which are themselves what? KSQL queries, streams applications, consumer applications, whatever they are. All my data is in topics. So now I can do authoritative reporting on the stuff in my cluster. <clears throat> um, said this before, but just to make sure this is clear, uh, inside each service, I have the freedom to create a materialized view, either using Kafka Streams or using Postgres or Mongo, or maybe I have some crazy thing that I need to use Cassandra for. I don't know. Uh, you always have permission to create a materialized view. Why? Because you have immutable events stored in Kafka. So every service knows it can always blow away. It's, it's, local cache of the data and rebuild it, and it's okay. You'll, you'll get a proper view of that data. If you use Kafka Streams for that, you get a few things for free. Um, you do get uh, uh, basically free state management of the tables that you create with Kafka Streams. If one of the instances of your service goes down and it's got you know, this table that it's managing of, of stock using the Kafka Streams API, that service goes down, you need to spin up a new one to replace it. Uh, Kafka Streams will have persisted that local state to a, an internal topic inside the Kafka cluster. So when you stand up the replacement node, you get that for free. Or as I said, you can just use a database. What you end up doing, and I'm going to talk more about this, concentrate a little bit more on this concept in my talk this afternoon, is that you have kind of created a database inside out. In other words, at the heart of every database, there's always a log, right? There's always a, a commit log somewhere. Uh, and here, instead of one big database with all our, our data in it, we said, let's make one big commit log 
and build a bunch of services with little copies of the data that we need hanging off of that commit log. Uh, more on that idea this afternoon. And I'm going to skip this for in the interests of time. We also have a transactional API available in Kafka. Now, uh, you can program this directly at the producer and consumer level as of Kafka uh, uh, 0.11 um, when uh, exactly, exactly once semantics were released. Really, that took the form of a couple of things, one of which is a transactional API. Uh, so, if I'm dealing with, with uh, purely with Kafka, I have the ability to wrap multiple partition writes within transactions. And Streams does a lot of this for me for free. If you're using producer and consumer, uh, those low-level low APIs directly, you also have uh, access to that transactional API uh, that you can do. And this kind of framework gives you that ecosystem that I mentioned before. I've got a bunch of independent services all consuming immutable events in Kafka topics. Each new service that grows, uh, or e each service that you deploy, doesn't need to know about new services that might grow up on the data it's producing. Uh, those new services, you're free simply to build them, uh, and you're truly decoupled. So, like I said, this whole event-driven architecture thing, uh, the concepts we get from domain-driven design, uh, the stream processing thing, these are optimizing for different goals. One is trying to help you handle complex domains. One is trying to help you do big things. Uh, but they are linked. So what do you do? Well, as always, start simple and evolve. Uh, build a service. Rather than having that service make synchronous calls, have services, when you, the first thing that you're refactoring, uh, broadcast events. It publishes events out to a Kafka topic. Retain them in a log so you have the ability to uh, rewind in history, reprocess things, uh, build new services based on that log, build reporting based on that log, uh, and then evolve that event stream with new services using Kafka streams to do whatever sort of computation you need to do. Uh, in those new services, you've got that, that rich API available to you. And when you need to, when you need to query, because of course you can't query a log, that's a terrible experience, when you need to query things, you build up uh, that local materialized view using whatever database uh, functionality you need to. If it's a K table in streams, great. If it's a Cassandra cluster because something really got big, also great. Whatever your service needs, you can build that. <clears throat> All right, if you want more, that's a good slide to take a picture of. Uh, links to code, to Confluent Cloud, to the book, which I solemnly charge you all to go read this weekend or next week or whenever you can get to it. And like I said, we have a few minutes here, but uh, I want you to know uh, because of the, the, the Ben rescheduling thing, uh, this afternoon's talk uh, that I'm giving some overlap with this. So if you come, I'll try to tell different jokes. They're not identical, uh, but they are similar. So just so you know, you can plan your afternoon accordingly. Thanks for being here. Have a good one.